Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today we're going to do something really cool. We're going to paint fur and get ready for a lot of little thin lines. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get into the technique and learn it Vinci V style. So I've got this really cool figure. This is like a sort of Torin or something from World of Warcraft. I don't know. It's a unique sculpt. A friend of mine who's a sculptor gave it to me and asked if I wanted to paint it. And I said, yes, I always love painting unique and individual and unusual things. And this guy's just really cool. So today we're going to paint him up and we're going to use the new Adam paints uh, from Big Child Creative. Ruben Martinez's paint line he did uh, in association with Ammo by MIG that Big Child is selling. Uh, but <clears throat> specifically, we'll review those at a later date. So look forward to that. But uh, we're going to be talking about how to simulate fur over a flat surface. This is really challenging because a lot of models we end up painting like horses and other things like that often don't have the fur modeled, yet clearly they would have, you know, short hair or fur or something like that on them. So we're going to I'm going to take you through the process of how you get that down. Let's get over to the desk. Let's start painting. All right, this guy's got a little two-tone build. So he's got the sort of white or, or lighter color chest, as animal creatures often do, uh, the underbelly sort of, and then darker uh, the rest of the way around. And the first step is just laying down a base coat. And I actually did that off camera because you don't need to see me just lay down a base coat on there. But the important part to understand about that base coat I laid down is that I'm working in basically my shadow tone. It won't end up being the absolute darkest, but it's very near it. So I want to work in a very low, very shadowed tone. Then what I'm going to start doing is integrating in slowly whatever my environmental color is to add some highlight. Now in this case, what I'm going to be doing is slowly integrating both uh, a little bit of orange, a little bit of yellow ochre, and a little bit of white. Now, as I paint this and build up on the orange, each time that I do this, I'm covering less and less space with my little lines. Let's talk about the essentials as you watch me painting these first layers. So things to understand and contemplate here when you're doing this is first, I want you to understand that this is no different than painting with layers. I think where people often get tripped up with this is because we're painting in little thin sharp lines, they suddenly think it's an entirely different experience. But really that's not what's happening. Imagine this were a flat surface and it was just skin not uh not fur you would paint it by layers you would have you know shingles on a roof laying top of each other moving up to your highlights we're going to do the exact same thing how much we cover how much we increase our value steps all of it is exactly the same as if we're layering the only difference is instead of sweeping one solid layer of paint on we're just making a lot of sharp thin lines and that leads me to my next point You'll see as I'm working this up that I'm using a very sharp brush and doing lots of repeated thin lines. In fact, I'll often go back and cover the same area two or three times with the same color, but not I won't cover the exact same space. I'll do different lines in slightly different places as slightly different lengths, things like that. Having that variance is one of the absolute keys to making this work. And by applying multiple coats of the same thin layer, you get higher intensity where the different little thin lines intersect or overlay each other. In that way, it looks much more naturalistic. So you're not trying to trace on a series of lines and then go back and fill them out and exactly paint the same lines. That will just make it look fake. Instead, what you'll see I'm doing is painting the lines and then going back with the same paint and covering now different. Each lines are in different places, different spaces, different widths, different lengths, right? As I move my way around the figure, creating slight variations in each effectively value layer of the fur to create that realistic feeling that there's a lot of different layers of fur going on here that it's packed quite tightly. As I move on, I just continue integrating in additional yellow ochre and then eventually a little bit of white uh, along with some of that orange. I want it to be a nice warm upper layer uh, of the fur. 
And you can see as I'm moving up the value spectrum, it's actually starting to show. Some of those initial layers are pretty light. You don't really see much of the effect. You can kind of a little bit if you turn it in a bright light, but for the most part, it won't be too impactful. We're moving in very gentle value increases here. But as soon as we start really getting any of that white in there, we're gonna move away from the transparent oranges and yellows and into something that will have a high opacity and show hard layer lines. So we need to integrate that very, very, very carefully. Very little of the white moves in, and we're just relying on creating lots of those sharp, thin layers. One of the important things you're doing when you're working up this orange texture, this orange color, is you have to work back down. So I don't just only progress up in the layers. I will also bring the value back down by mixing a thinner glaze of the previous step that I just did, and then doing more sharp, thin lines with the glaze over the edge of my previous layer of lines to sort of blend them and smooth them in and create new, thinner, lighter lines. Again, just like doing multiple layers with the lighter color, when we actually uh, when we actually then apply these little thin glazes, it helps to soften the transitions as we're moving up while also uh, then allowing for it to sort of blend in and create more tonal variation of the different elements. As I move up the surface toward the top, again, as per usual, my highlights are going to focus toward the top of each individual uh, to the total volume to each muscle structure. Uh, and then that's where I'm going to build in my highest highlights, integrating in those elements of uh, the most powerful highlight. To, and yet again, still, I'm doing this in multiple layers, oftentimes taking the same color, doing it two or three times, varying the exact coverage placement and length with each application until eventually I get to my highest highlight here and I just have that little bit of light catch under the hair. So, uh, but that's just the orange part. Now I want to talk about the white. That's a little different story because it's a little more challenging. All right, so when we're doing the white fur, this presents us an interesting challenge because I'm, I'm starting here in this sort of muddy yellow, brown, grayish tone that I've mixed up, which is fairly neutral in tone, like a warm neutral. Uh, but I'm going to need to get up to something near a pure white, though not exactly. As always, we reserve, we don't really use dead white, but we're going to get close-ish. However, because we're going to be working all in the spectrum and the fur does need to appear roughly white-ish, we're going to make sure that we are uh, working uh, up very, very, very gradually. Now, as I'm working this, you'll notice that I'm often then going back to a darker layer and applying it on. So as I move up the white, it's really important that just as before, I'm blending those in, bringing those colors together. And you'll see I move up very, very gradually. Now, as a point of fact, if you jump too far or get too bright too suddenly, don't worry, it's fine. The key with this is just to keep making halfway steps thinning it out and then glazing it back down on the bottom edge. I don't cover over everything I do. I only cover just slight bits of the end to sort of blend the two individual things together. And I will do this repeatedly until eventually I get up to something that's a fairly bright gray. Now, on camera, this looks pretty white, but I assure you there is no pure white used in this. You can check out my recent video on understanding painting white if you want to see how much you can deviate from actual dead white and still have it look white in your composition. But again, I'm doing the same things, forcing those highlights, especially on areas like the center of the face, the sort of T-zone, even though he's got that big flat nose, the tops of his uh, sort of pectoral muscles and, and all those other things, the tops of his biceps, um, those areas where we would see the light gathering the most. Uh, is where I'm really bringing those highlight ups, bringing those highlights up to their sort of maximum amount of the uh, value that I want to reach. Now, eventually I get to the point where I've got to sort of let it sit. A lot of this figure is still pretty close to black because it's still in the original primer, and that's going to throw off your perception of value. So that means we've got to go and sort of paint the rest of the model before we decide if our final highlights are high enough and so on. But there is one more step we're going to do to call it a, before we call it a day on painting this fur. 
The next thing we're going to do is a little tricky. Now, I'm going to do this with the airbrush, but you don't have to. You could just as easily do this with the brush. So here I'm breaking out my Speed Paint 2.0, and we're going to do some thin filters. I'm going to use a couple of different dark and medium tones, especially the sort of pale, uh, ruddy pink yellows, those kind of tones, as well as some of the deeper, like there's a deeper green brown and, and blue black. And what I'm going to do is thin that way down. This is about eight drops of thinner to four drops or three drops of Speed Paint 2.0, so quite thin. And I'm going to just very carefully build naturally up my shadow using the airbrush. Now this is using my uh, uh, hard Steenbeck Infinity and a 0.15 needle, or sorry, 0.2 needle. Um, so I'm working very, very, very small here, and I'm using this very thin filter to, to just cover over and increase and tone my shadows, uh, as well as then apply some filter over some of the mid-tone colors. None of this is meant to hide the previous work. The key is to work extremely thin, but by laying down that environmental light filter over the fur, it makes it feel more realistic. You would just see less of the individual fur texture down in the shadows because, well, there's less light to get to catch on the fur and to reflect. So we still want the texture there. It's there when you look at it, but it's filtered through the light or shadow of that environmental light. This extra little step, which again, you can always just do by brush, carefully applying a glaze or a filter, just like I'm doing with the airbrush. I'm doing it here with the airbrush because frankly, it's faster. Uh, but what it does is it brings all of the fur into a unified environmental shadow and highlight. So in the same way that I used a, the, the, the similar sort of colors to work my way up into the highlights, both of the, uh, both the white chest and the uh, orange yellow fur having both a little bit of ochre and a little bit of white in them as I approach the highlights. Here as well, I want to tone the shadows and bring them into a unified shadow color to show that this creature exists in a credible environment where there's a sort of singular light that's lighting him and a singular shadow that's, that's uh, creating a singular set of shadows, as it were, um, generated by that single temperature light source. This final step is completely optional. Certainly you can get very credible fur on your horses, your dogs, your animals, whatever fun furry pets you might have in your figures or your army um, without doing this. This is just sort of an extra step because this is a little more of a display model, but you should feel like this is completely optional if you want to go down this road. There we go. I would say he's done, but I'll be honest with you, he's not. I've still got a lot more work to do on this guy. And in fact, you might see him again in a future video. We'll see what shakes out. Uh, but overall, I hope you got a good impression of what it was to paint the fur and how that all comes out. This was a really fun project to work on. This model's really cool and unique, and it's exciting to paint something that's, you know, kind of rare and fun and that, that a friend of mine sculpted. So uh, thank you to Dave for sculpting this awesome work. Uh, I really love the fig. And uh, um, thank you all for watching. I really appreciate that. If you liked this, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you've got a question about maybe a fig you're tackling, drop that down in the comments below. In fact, if you've got any questions about anything hobby related, I'm always happy to help and I always read every comment. If you want to support the channel, there's lots of ways you can do so. There's links down below, affiliate links for things like my lights and all the hobby supplies you see me use. So if you want to pick any of that up, click those links. You can do so. It doesn't cost you anything extra. In fact, in many cases, it might save you some money, uh, but it does give a nice kickback to the channel. There's also our Patreon focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.